So now we'd like to focus on an important area that we would like to get roundtable member feedback on, which is public engagement. And we have Kieran Parmar on our CTC team who's going to start with a snapshot of how the commission's existing public engagement practices are set up. And then we're gonna follow that with an interactive discussion where we will all ask, or we will ask all of you to weigh in um, with your feedback and ideas regarding how you know, the commission, as well as just transportation planning, funding, and project delivery efforts in general could grow in this area. So Kieran, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. Um, good afternoon, Roundtable members, Chair Norton, uh, commissioners, and members of the public. I'm happy to be here today as a member of CTC staff, and I will be presenting on current public engagement efforts at the Commission. Um, and like Laura mentioned, following my presentation, we've prepared some discussion questions, and we look forward to hearing your feedback and recommendations for ways um, in which we can enhance community and public engagement best practices. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the commission is subject to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, which requires any meeting of the commission where six or more commissioners are present to be publicly noticed and conducted openly um, so that the public can remain informed and have an opportunity to participate. And additionally, any actions of the commission must be taken and deliberated on openly. Um, commission meetings occur approximately seven times per year for two consecutive days um, during normal business hours. Um, the meeting agenda and the meeting materials are posted at least 10 days in advance uh, of the meeting and they are posted on the web, uh, CTC website. Um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, meetings were held in person and they were open to the public to attend. Additionally, all meetings were broadcast live uh, for viewers to access the meeting remotely. Um, people participating in person were able to provide in-person feedback. Um, and those who are unable to participate in person could also provide comments via email or other written forms of correspondence prior to the meeting. Um, during the pandemic, meetings have been held via GoToWebinar. Uh, the virtual meeting platform that we're using right now. And members of the public are given the opportunity to provide comments verbally or submit them in writing via the chat box or email. Um, additionally, commission meetings are webcast via YouTube. Um, and those unable to participate in person can also provide comments via phone, email, or other written forms of correspondence. Um, next slide, please, Bridget. Um, so listed on the screen are a few examples of commission planning and program guidelines, um, which include guidance for agencies throughout the state on how best to conduct public engagement for transportation projects and plans. Um, the commission regularly updates its planning and program guidelines and we hope that our conversation today can inform the next iterations of these documents. Nominated projects for most funding programs administered by the commission must be included in a regional transportation plan, also known as an RTP, um, that meets state and federal requirements. Um, the RTP guidelines are maintained by commission and by the commission and include a chapter and an appendix that are dedicated to public engagement best practices. Um, for example, chapter four, RTP consultation and coordination of the 2017 RTP guidelines highlights various requirements for RTP public engagement, including consultation and coordination, Title VI and environmental justice considerations, um, social equity factors, a participation plan, uh, private sector involvement, consultation with all interested parties, input 
and consultation on sustainable communities strategy development, uh, interagency coordination, Native American tribal government coordination, um, resource agency consultation, and coordinated public transit human services transportation plans. Um, other planning guidelines that the commission maintains include the multimodal corridor plan and the California transportation plan guidelines. These guidelines provide direction to Caltrans and other transportation agencies about how to incorporate community and stakeholder outreach into the planning process. Um, com uh, commission competitive funding programs require applicants to describe the community engagement process through which the nominated project was developed and how the project itself meets um, is meeting a community identified need. For example, the Solutions for Congested Corridors program, which funds infrastructure project in the state's most congested corridors, requires a description of how local residents and community-based organizations were engaged in developing the project, how the final project will address community-identified needs along the corridor with a description of the benefits the project will provide for disadvantaged communities and low-income areas, any negative aspects to a disadvantaged community and low-income community. They must include a map to identify whether or not the project is located in a disadvantaged community, um, and feedback received from stakeholders and how stakeholders will continue to be engaged during the implementation process. Next slide, please. Um, so next, I wanted to provide some more information on public engagement efforts for another commission funding program, the Active Transportation Program, um, which supports projects that lead to increased walking and bicycling. Um, CTC staff conducted extensive stakeholder engagement in preparation for the 2021 Active Transportation Program. Um, staff conducted 60 uh, project site visits in 31 cities throughout the state from November 2019 to uh, March 2020. Staff held 21 workshops categorized by either central workshops or branch workshops. Um, and a central workshop focused on revising and updating program guidelines, applications, and scoring rubrics. Branch workshops were more informal and targeted areas of the state that have seen less success in the active transportation program. The focus was to educate attendees about the basics of the program and provide any technical assistance. Um, staff also prepared the active transportation engagement summary to highlight the lessons learned and outcomes from the 2021 active transportation program engagement process. And that document is posted on the um, Active Transportation webpage on the CTC website. Um, and before I hand it back over to Laura um, to facil facilitate a discussion around the questions that the CTC staff have prepared, um, I just wanted to ask if there's any questions from the roundtable members or others listening in um, about how the commission currently conducts public engagement. Thanks, Kieran. Not seeing any public comment at this time. Just looking to see if any roundtable members are coming off mute. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move into um, the interactive discussion portion of this item. And 
basically at this point, what we want to do is look to you all who have extensive experience actually engaging with communities, um, conducting workshops and public meetings, and we'd like to get your feedback on these questions. Um, they're really designed to try and highlight some of the challenges in the engagement process um, and to help us identify, identify ways in which the commission can improve its practices in this area when it comes to our meetings and workshops and how we address engagement in our planning and programming guidelines. So we, we did share these questions with you all in advance, um, and I figured I would start by walking through them. But I, I want to make sure you all know that you know we're happy to pivot the discussion to address any engagement issues that you all want to cover. So I see this as a guide, um, but not something that we have to follow extremely closely. So why don't we go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay. So question number one asks what barriers or challenges your community or the communities that you work with experience in engaging on transportation plans or projects. Any thoughts from roundtable members on this one? You probably have a lot of thoughts on this one, but how do you put them all? I can jump in first and say it's been mentioned a bunch of times already, but I think especially in virtual times, one of the barriers we're seeing is the digital divide. Um, and so I think you put on you put all the normal barriers that that folks are are facing, and there's this this digital divide piece, and I think that's both engaging with meetings like this, but also I think the digital divide is showing up in access to information because as more and more um, agencies um, and departments are putting information out there, often technology is being leveraged since we can't have meetings. And so if you already had a digital divide um, issue, not only are you not attending the meetings, but oftentimes you're also not getting that information. That is extremely good point. Thank you. Lena, did you have something to add? I did, thank you. Um, that's, that's such an excellent point. And then I think when folks are able to overcome that barrier and actually be able to participate, one of the challenges or barriers that I see is that a lot of the language that's used in these uh, meetings or plans is not community friendly. And so it's not accessible. Um, so like you need an interpreter for the English, to the English. And then when we look at, you know, uh, translating or interpreting into other languages, it's um, we're we're often doing that, and, and you know, a great interpreter or translator will do it exactly as it was intended. But again, it's still not accessible language, so we're still using really complicated terminology um, jargon that isn't really easy to understand. And so I think that that turns off a lot of folks from wanting to engage as well when they don't see themselves able to participate in the language. So um, just Thinking about that, you know, I often I often suggest that we bring uh, whenever you're creating, you create in multiple languages, or you bring folks to the table who work in multiple languages, so that they can address, you know, um, oftentimes like we we use jargon or acronyms or idioms, for example, things that don't necessarily work in other languages without context. So starting to to think that way can can help us to be able to access more of our community um, so that they're not just present in the room, but they actually can engage. And that's the, the piece we're talking about right, is engaging, not just having um, bodies in the room or, or uh, faces on, on the, on the uh, screen. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. So um, I'm gonna go across my screen for who I saw come on camera or off mute. And so I think that would be Jasmine, then Naila, and then Rio. Oh, so Jasmine, yeah. oh. Go okay. right ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna, um, thanks. I was just gonna ask, is there any existing written guidance that the commission currently uses for public engagement or is it, um, is it just staff kind of doing the public engagement based on the needs of that particular project? And furthermore, do you all, um, if you do have that, do you require your either business associates who are doing work on your behalf or um, the agencies that you're granting funds to for projects to also use? 
Thanks, Jasmine. That's an excellent question. So for part number one, we do not have like a formal public engagement policy in place. What we have is, um, I would say, sort of a long-standing state of practice that we have established. Um, I think that when it comes to the commission's public engagement efforts, um, you know, we we have our commission meetings. Uh, and we follow Bagley Keene, and those are, I would say, very typical, you know, commission, state commissioner board meeting. Um, and then we also have our program specific workshops um, for our program guidelines and our planning guidelines. And those I see as uh, the opportunity where we try to focus more on um, engagement. So I think there's an opportunity for us to grow in both areas. One thing um, that I wanted to mention when it came to like our business associates, so we we don't generally, the commission doesn't do a whole lot of contracting out for specific uh, services, but what we do is we essentially look to the regional and local governments that are nominating projects. So for example, any project that the commission funds has to be in a regional transportation plan. And that regional transportation plan um, has to uh, comply with you know, federal and state requirements around public engagement. So we look to the regional and local folks um, to have their engagement plans in place uh, that meet, you know, federal and state standards. You know, we offer best practices information for regional plans. Um, but I think we recognize that when it comes to um, a lot of the planning and project level work that eventually bubbles up to the commission, that engagement is very localized. That context is very local. I think, um, you know, we certainly hear the suggestion um, to have more formalized policies um, so that we can ensure that we are uh, make, we are doing our best when it comes to conducting our business. Um, and I think that it's also really important um, that we figure out how to make sure that we're asking of our project applicants the right kinds of questions around the engagement efforts that go into um, the projects and plans that they are working on. And I guess I would be remiss without mentioning also that, you know, we do operate pursuant to Title VI. And so um, there's outreach and engagement pieces to that. So very long-winded answer to that question. I'm sorry. I hope that um, it answered what you were looking for. Thank you. Okay, Nayula. So I um, am going to meet to everything around the digital divide in language, but I also want to take this like a little bit more macro and talk about one of the biggest challenges is just like the paradigm in which we have to engage in. Um, community engagement is reactionary. It is two minutes relegated at the end of a topic where you have people who are quote unquote experts who have just delivered a presentation and the community has to come and give, you know, a two minute reaction. Um, and that's disemp it's, it's disempowering to communities that actually are living and utilizing and, and dealing with the infrastructure that we're talking about building, and they're treated as, less, as if they're not experts. It's about um, the layers of bureaucracy you have to get through to even provide that input and then to have it listened to and responded to. Um, because even when you are able to give your two minutes, it's two minutes, you're told it's documented, and then there's not ever any accountability. There's never a time where you know someone has to get back to you. I think also limiting the scope of the conversation when we're talking about like planning and guidelines, um, a lot of the times the conversations are so limited in scope where, especially in our disadvantaged communities that have compounding issues, um, someone wants to talk to me about where to put a bike lane and I wanna talk to you about like illegal dumping in my neighborhood. And for me, the two are intricately linked, but because that's not what the scope of the conversation is, then that input is invalid. So figuring out how we can have like more holistic conversations around not just transportation infrastructure and transportation projects, but like communities and how people live in communities and interact with communities. And then um, I think also just shifting to all of that, just shifting the way we think about the ladder of engagement and the paradigm shift, I think if we really are talking about engaging communities, then we have to like start with that framing. We can't plug in more community engagement into this system. We really need to think about if community engagement was at the forefront of what we wanted to do here, then what would that look like? 
And then I think we take like that vision and where we are today, and then we try and like work and meet in the middle. But to just pile on like, how can we be better at engagement and add like multiple languages, which is necessary, but that's not gonna get at the crux of what the issue is because the whole paradigm is broken. That is excellent feedback, Naila. I think that's given us a lot to think about. Okay, let's go, let's do Rio, then Russell, and then I'm gonna go Connie, Leslie, and then I'm gonna look to the chat. All right, uh, yeah, so definitely ditto uh, Lena and Tamika's point. And yeah, Naila, you just nailed a lot of my concerns here when we think about uh, just the paradigm that there is, you know, and I'll give a, a, a little short narrative of my experience. I, I know that it's changed because of the pandemic and that we're in virtual, but I did get to attend one of the CTC uh, meetings, thanks to actually the uh, policy link and um, Cal Bike at the time that was, and PMJ, where we were organizing a policy advocacy. And we went to the CTC meeting, you know, with our community, we had youth and elders and you know i think the biggest aha moment was that when we walked in everybody seemed shocked you know and this is this is very profound you know because most people that were in the in the room in the audience were actually still people in suits and had a particular language and a particular way of moving around and when we came in people were just shocked and to the point of people you know kind of like i don't know if it was security or administration that was on the side was really questioning what we were doing there. Um, you know, this is like heartbreaking, right, to report, but that, that's the reality. That is what we faced. We actually ended up leaving. And we're talking about people across the state that are comfortable doing advocacy. A lot of us did advocacy at the local level. And when we went to the CTC, it was like a very disparate-like situation. Like there was a ton of dissonance. So definitely to, to like get that to underline and underscore to the point Naila was making is that there is a lot of work to be done. And again, going back to what I was naming in the scope, some of this is really naming the power dynamics as if why some members in our community have the title to decide how funding will be used. That is what I always say, taxpayer money, you know. So again, how do we get it into the hands of the people who most need it? Um, and, and, and that to me is going to start helping alleviate a lot of these barriers. And I guess one more point on that, uh, the continuous thought of having to have community come to this spot, right? Versus, and I think somebody said it in the chat, versus how does the CCT, CTC continuously and Caltrans and Calsta, et cetera, go to the community and actually see at eye level, right? Um, boots on the ground kind of deal, like see what's actually going on because that would really make a huge difference in how community engagement is done. Thank you, Rio. The experience that you described, um, you know, is not okay and is something that I think we see as, uh, you know, there is a, a tremendous amount of room for improvement. I will just leave it at that. So maybe what I can do is jump to Connie really quick because Connie, your, uh, your chat sort of seems to build off of a little bit what Rio was saying. So do you want to go ahead and make your comment and then I can kick it over to Russell? I, I was uh, would plus one everything everyone said and I, I was going to take off my mic early and go broadband. I was like, you guys are so tired of hearing about me and broadband, but so thank you everybody else. But uh, you know, I, I just want to say also that in some ways, it's like the community is doing planning, community development planning, and the transportation agencies are not at that table, right? So we have to come to your table when we're talking about the right of way, but you're not at our tables where we're talking about safety and how to live and everything. So it's so I especially notice this with broadband uh, planning because we are we've been working for 20 years to get broadband to tribal and remote rural communities. And now we finally have providers and it's like getting permitting through Caltrans and Caltrans is like, why didn't you come to us earlier? And it's like, we have been having this conversation. We've invited you to the room every time. Now we need your right away. And we are acting like this is new. And I'll just add one more thing to the experience. When you know me, a black woman, goes to a meeting with Caltrans staff, who are in my case all white and they say 
our right of way and our road system. It impacts us. It's not their road system. It's the, you know, it's the state of California's road system. But if they don't set it up in a way where it's like, how can we help communities meet their goals? It's like, you just bumped into us, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, so it's a whole mindset change and it's really you know because we have districts in some cases it's fight them like you know people have different experiences with different districts and some districts are like at other tables or have individuals at other tables and others are like we don't participate until you're in our right away thank you connie that was a, a really good perspective and i think uh, the words that state agencies use matter a lot Okay, so let's go over to Russell. Thanks, and I'm going to echo a lot of what I've heard already. Um, I really appreciated Rio sharing uh, their experience. I thought that that was really um, helpful. I also have uh, can recall from many times that I was uh, participating in various local community, you know, quote unquote, engagement around projects where there are, you know, there's kind of an environment that is not conducive to including people with disabilities largely. And the infamous, you know, kind of charrette style uh, configuration, unless there is someone on staff who is actively, you know, making sure that people are able to access the space and participate, it falls apart. and for someone who's having a first time experience at one of these um, events, it can be very disempowering. Likewise, um, those who are uh, transportation, public transportation dependent, often have trouble accessing these meetings that are in the evening because the, the infrastructure just doesn't support their return trip home. And that's reality for a lot of low income people that are having to make all sorts of um, cut corners off of their personal lives to be uh, available for these events. So um, I do appreciate that we're in kind of a, a world where we're talking about, you know, opening up some of these uh, doors, you know, using using technology, but we also do have to acknowledge the digital divide and make sure that um, the digital infrastructure is just as accessible. Thanks. Thanks, Russell. Uh, I am going to forever remember that phrase, cutting corners off their personal lives to attend our events, because that's exactly what is happening. And we need to be aware of that. I did want to mention really briefly, Russell, um, to your comments earlier regarding um, accessibility in terms of captioning and um, ASL translation. So I am happy to report that our YouTube feed does offer uh, captioning, and we are working on um, procuring some ASL translation services. One missing piece in all of this though is sort of how we make that YouTube feed interactive. So definitely there's some space to talk more about that and get more um, feedback from you all on that. So love to push that to a future conversation. Okay, Leslie, I believe that you were off mute. Good afternoon. I actually am echoing off of what has been previously said, and I think it's really imperative that we look at the fact that all of the existing planning analysis and um, guidance, it doesn't always align with the tribal community context and needs, and it's not clear what the benefits of those planning um, tools will provide to um, transportation project selection and delivery in tribal communities. So it's just imperative that we really look at shifting the whole paradigm because we won't get the engagement. We won't get community engagement um, until there is some type of shift. 
Thanks, Leslie. That was a really good point. I wanted to go to the chat box right now um, just to highlight something that Randy brought up earlier um, around Lena's comments um, with respect to you know using jargon and, and using language that's not language that's not accessible to the public, English language for English speakers sometimes. Um, and that's you know that planners too often frame community or public conversations as if they're presenting to other planners. Um, I resemble that remark sometimes, and so uh, I think that's a really important, um, you know, note for all of us. And as we do technical work, to recognize that it needs to be presented in a way that the public can understand and, quite frankly, can care about. So I don't know, Randy. I just totally represented your comment. If you would like to to chime in. Oh no! Thanks for reading that out. Um, yeah, you know. Sadly, we've seen you know language used often to to disarm folks, and um, and technical you know analyses used to disarm kind of um, community members who are advocating for a certain vision. So I think um, be more mindful of, of the language that we use is important, and and collaborating with um, organizers and popular education specialists I think would help us find language that is more accessible that folks um, utilize in day to day experiences, and hopefully. Um, can bring more people in on the, the conversation around planning their own communities. Thanks, Randy. I wanted to also um, highlight that Keith shared uh, some publications that we can um, make sure go out to the whole group. Um, uh, in particular, one entitled Human Centered Design for Community Engagement. And I don't know, Keith, if you wanted to follow up with any uh, any remarks around your reference to those documents. Okay, well, we will make sure to share those resources. Okay, so I want to check in and see if there are any other roundtable members uh, that have comments on question number one. Okay, so Seeing none or, or hearing none at this point, um, I would like to um, provide an opportunity for Jeannie Ward-Waller to uh, come off mute and speak a little bit uh, regarding what she's heard. Thanks, Laura. Um, I just want to appreciate all the input um, and particularly um, the comments, you know, Connie spoke specifically about um, working with Caltrans staff out in the district and, you know, getting, uh, hearing words that refer to the infrastructure as ours, meaning ours Caltrans, which is uh, clearly uh, not not the right attitude, not the right language to be using with uh, community uh, members and, and organizations that are served. It should be served. It should be theirs. Um, so I just really appreciate that feedback and want you all to know that um, you know, we're, we're here, we're listening. Um, there is a huge amount of culture shift happening in our organization. So I hope we are getting better at that. I hope that you will see um, a change in, um, you know, how, how we are coming to the community and wanting to engage in a meaningful way and wanting to, um, you know, be there in service to the community and not, um, you know, the community serving us or some, you know, some kind of uh, sort of backwards approach. So, um, you know, that's that's part of why we're happy to to be participating in this roundtable and hearing from all of you. Um, and I just, you know, want to make a personal commitment on on my behalf and and on behalf of our executive team that we really, um, you know, care deeply about this issue. We're trying to do better, and um, you know, being a big bureaucracy, it takes time. So we're going to continue to to make mistakes, um, but hopefully. Um, as our chief deputy likes to say, fail forward and get better um, and, and you know, show up in a more meaningful way. So just, yeah, appreciate those comments specifically um, about Caltrans, but, you know, generally, Randy, your comments about, um, you know, we use overly technical jargon in community meetings. I mean, that's another huge pet peeve of mine. Um, this isn't, you know, rocket science. It's, uh, it's, um, you know, addressing people's transportation needs. And so we should be able to talk about it in a way that people can understand. Um, so that's another, you know, 
thing that we need to to get better at if if we're going to um, engage meaningfully with um, with the communities that we serve. So um, just yeah, thanks to all of you. Um, there's a lot of work to do here. Um, we're very committed and um, just really look forward to digging in deeper in the next meeting and um, continuing to hear from you about where we need to improve. So thanks. Thanks for that, Jeannie. Appreciate it. Okay, any final remarks from Roundtable members on this particular piece? Okay, I'm gonna look. Do we have any public comment? We don't currently have any public comment. Okay, I have a proposal. We got through the first question. Clearly, we were slightly too ambitious to try and cover um, any of the other questions in our time, but what we would like to do, if it's okay with everyone, uh, is we would like to synthesize what we've heard on question one, give you all some time to think more on, on the other questions, and essentially bring back this topic uh, to dig in on a little bit more at our next roundtable meeting, or I should say a future roundtable meeting. Does that sound okay to the group? Okay, see a thumbs up. Okay, great. All right, so that is what we will plan on doing moving forward. Uh, so at this point, um, you know, the next formal item on our agenda is our uh, public comment period. And you know, while we take public comment uh, during every item, we always want to make sure and carve out, you know, this space for uh, any comments from the public. And I actually was uh, remiss that I haven't checked in with our Spanish language or a Spanish translation feed to see if there's anything um, on that line. This is a Spanish interpreter. Uh, I did not hear any Spanish comments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and roll into our final item, which is meeting recap and next steps. Wow, so we did it. We made it through our first equity advisory roundtable meeting, just about. And uh, I think I wanted to kick off this particular item by you know, just essentially thanking everyone who participated today. Uh, we really value your input, and I especially value uh, the fact that folks are so willing, you know, to be vulnerable, to share their personal stories, to talk about their lived experiences. I know that that's um, probably not an easy thing to do, and it's incredibly appreciated. Um, and I just want to make sure that um, this group knows how very seriously we take all of the feedback that we are hearing from you guys today. We feel like this is a really good opportunity for us to try and build some more meaningful relationships with one another as we you know, continue this journey as a roundtable in the next few months. Uh, really, really great comments and feedback um, regarding just essentially what are the current equity issues in our transportation planning, you know, funding and project delivery processes. Um, you know, we really touched on a number of good points about how we conduct public outreach, what that means, what it means to be successful at that, you know, and, and how it's not a check the box exercise. And there's a, a big difference between uh, doing public outreach, for example, and actually engaging underserved communities. Um, we definitely look forward to continuing the conversation, um, you know, on the engagement piece. And uh, we especially appreciate uh, the thoughtful feedback on the charter. That's gonna be a really important document as we move forward. So I wanted to just um, echo that we are going to, you know, take the feedback that we heard from you all. Uh, I believe that this webinar will be recorded on our YouTube channel uh, for, you know, future viewing pleasure. And we will uh, be disseminating some summary notes to you all roundtable members so that you can get a sense of how we heard things and make sure to correct if we heard anything, um, you know, incorrectly. So in terms of next steps, you know, we will have materials for you all to, to review and that will be posted in advance of our next meeting, which is currently scheduled for Wednesday, May 26th, and that is from 1 to 4 p.m. via GoToWebinar. And, you know, specifically what we want to highlight for discussion at that meeting will be a revised charter, 
that'll have your feedback. Um, we also are anticipating a presentation on the community listening sessions that are being jointly developed. Uh, Caltrans is leading them and CTC and CalSTA are assisting. So that's what we have to look forward to uh, next month. And I think with that, I want to just thank you all again for being here, for showing up, and for helping us uh, you know, figure out what we have to do and how we're gonna do it. So uh, with that, I will consider this uh, first roundtable meeting to be adjourned and give you all four minutes of your personal life back, hopefully. And just thank you again. Much, much appreciated.